Hello, sound, 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 check, check. Thank you. All right.
and every knee will bow before him and our God is the Lamb the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb ooh every knee will bow
God, we praise you this morning, God, and we thank you for your indescribably amazing love, God. Thank you for showing us what it means to truly be loved, Lord, when you sent your son to die on that cross for us, Lord. We are just in awe of your power, God, and your compassion and love that you have shown us, Lord. And I pray that we may show that same compassion and love unto others, God. We love you and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here is Brother Gary for our communion. Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? A little break in the weather, at least for a few hours, right? Okay. Well, this morning we are going to observe one of the two ordinances that God has given to us, and that is the Lord's Supper. So please make sure you've got your little communion cup. If you wish to participate, if you're going to participate in today's communion, please hold on to the bread and the juice as we will partake of them together as a family. So what is communion? When we take communion, we are celebrating the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. It is really just a simple act. There's nothing fancy about it. Nothing extravagant, nothing complicated. We are simply going to take a little piece of bread or a cracker and drink some juice. It's a reminder that Christ suffered and died for us on the cross. It's a statement of our faith. In 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, Paul reminds us of these words. He says, do this in remembrance of me. So when we eat the bread, we remember that Jesus' body was given for us. And when we drink the juice, we remember that Jesus' blood was shed for us. So again, it's a statement of our faith. It is not done as a tradition or a ritual. It is just a statement of our faith, that of which he has done for us and that which he is going to do for us in the future. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, we read, For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing and proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. And praise God, he is coming again. So what do we need to do in preparing for communion? Before we participate in this solemn ceremony, we need to prepare ourselves personally and spiritually. We need to take part of this worthily as we listen to the warning that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. It says, if anyone eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily, that person is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread or drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup unworthily, not honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. So each of us needs to examine ourselves and ask God, is there sin in my life that I need to confess and repent before I take communion? Is there anything in my life right now that does not please or honor him? If there is, we need to pray and ask God to forgive. As it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If there is anything between you and another person, you need to restore or make peace with that relationship. So now we're just going to take a moment to prepare ourselves for communion by examining ourselves personally and spiritually. So please close your eyes, take a moment to pray, and seek God out in this. Lord Jesus, 
as we take today's Holy Communion, please forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for any wrongs that we might have done you against you or others, knowingly or unknowingly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, we're now going to take communion, so please hold on to your bread. Have it ready. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24, On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, as we eat this bread, we thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for giving us your body and your life as a substitute for ours. Thank you for you have shown us what real love is when you died for us upon that cross. Let us now eat the bread together. And now let us hold the cup. In 1 Corinthians 11.25, it says, In the same way Jesus took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink of it. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we drink this cup, once again we thank you for what you have done for us on the cross. Thank you for your blood. Because of what you have done, we can be forgiven, restored, be saved, and be with our Father in heaven. Thank you for shedding your blood for us on the cross. In your name, amen. Let us now drink the juice together. Let us now pray. Lord, thank you for allowing us to participate in your Holy Communion today. Thank you for reminding us once again of your sacrifice on Calvary, that we might be saved. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we pray this with a grateful heart. In your name, amen. And now I'd like to call up Brother David for today's announcements. Thank you, Brother Gary. Welcome to February, first Sunday of February. We're technically halfway through or already officially spring, right? <laughs> okay, so this month is our heart, heart month, right? We see the decor and it's one, um, it's perfect theme for us to review how our heart is in terms of serving God and in his, in his ministry. So just a couple of reminders. Uh, recurring reminders for our ministry, uh, prayer meeting still on Wednesdays and Fridays. Uh, prayer meeting led by Pastor Romy will be on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. And if you have any prayer requests for Pastor Marco, please call or text or email him directly or uh, text him at uh, the number uh, posted there, 951-809-2807. And our Friday night youth Bible study, is also ongoing. It happens every Friday at 7 o'clock. So if you have young people in the house, uh, let us continue to uphold them and support this ministry, strengthen and grow this ministry. Reach out to P Pastor Marlon uh, regarding this activity if you're interested to join or support. And uh, for our listed calendar events, next week, uh, this coming February 11th, on Super Bowl Sunday, Brother Gary is hosting a Super Bowl party in their residence, and you are invited. So this is a great opportunity to, for us to get together, uh, of this, um, get outside of the Sunday church. You can invite friends who don't know Jesus yet and connect them to the body of Christ. So this is like a neutral ground. Uh, this is a potluck party, so feel free to bring food to share. The grill will also be open. Bring anything you'd like to grill and share with others. So if you're interested in coming, we have a sign-up sheet up front still. Uh, come and join us and make sure to wear your favorite football or sports jersey. All right. Uh, update on our Cambodia mission trip. We will be 
p- plugging this every Sunday so you can pray and plan for it. Uh, we continue our commitment to mission to the country of Cambodia. It will be for September 20 to 30, 2024. Start praying and saving. We have confirmed one physician from Kaiser has confirmed and already paid his accommodation for this mission. So, which means that this will uh, mission trip will have a medical clinic, missionary conference, and children's ministry. So, pray about it and uh, reach out to Sister Anna if you are interested in uh, joining or supporting this mission. And on February 25 will be our 19th year anniversary as a church. So come join and celebrate with us 19 years of God's faithfulness to this congregation. There will be a special program and lunch will be provided. Grab a flyer and invite your friends, your neighbors, your family to join this celebration. We also want to seek some assistance in setting up that day. So if you, ha- if you are available, we need s- to set up some tents, tables, and chairs. And we actually need more tents. So if you have some e- easy up tents that you can lend, I think we need about three more. Uh, it will be very much appreciated. Please coordinate with uh, Sister Leia, Brother Ricky, or Pastor Romy if you can uh, help in this uh, preparation. Now we jump to March. March 16th, 9 to 11 a.m., would like to encourage the church to go out to our communities and be part of the uh, Temecula Special Games for the city of Temecula. Let's reach out to our neighbors and uh, introduce Jesus by volunteering in this event. This is a very popular community event that many people sign up and volunteer for. So if you can go to the website at temeculacalifornia.gov slash special games to sign up, uh, that's the link. And hopefully we still have some slots for you to be able to join. Uh, March 17th will be our CCBC Health Fair. So here at CCBC, we are committed to your spiritual and physical well-being. We are organizing the first ever health fair for the church. I just got a confirmation from a nationally certified trainer who will be providing health coaching and personal training on that day. A healthy lunch will be provided right after the service, and we will have the fair open for lunch after that. So invite your friends, especially those who have been avoiding the doctor for some time. Uh, we will have you know, uh, a couple of health screenings that might be able to, we won't be treating people here, but it's just a matter of you know, where are you in terms of health and wellness, and we will give recommendations as far as that. We're not allowed to treat. There might be some giveaways of samples of uh, Ozempic. No, just kidding. <laughs> Okay, March 23, evangelism seminar between 8 to 12. So uh, I was listening to one of the devotionals and said that if you have your most important person in your house and you have guests over for a couple of hours, let's say for dinner, and never mention that very important person to your friends or your guests, how do you think that important person will feel? Let's say it's your wife. And then the whole crowd came and you didn't even mention her name. They don't even know you're married. And that's how exactly how we treat Jesus sometimes. We profess our love and faith to Jesus, but we never introduced him to anybody else. We never shared our faith, probably because we are not equipped to do so. We have fear surrounding our, um, about sharing the gospel. But if this is something that you uh, feel that applies to you, please sign up and join this evangelism seminar. You will be trained and empowered by Brother Gary. This will be facilitated by Brother Gary and Brother Jerry. So this is uh, spiritual equipping if this is an area that you think you need help on. All right, next we have our tithes and offerings. So last week we had our annual business meeting, which reminds us that our church exists in both the physical and spiritual realm. We have physical and financial needs as a church the faithful giving of the congregation is what keeps us functioning and uh, how we carry out the Lord's work. We discussed inspiring goals of potentially even having our own structure and property, house and lot and structure, instead of paying rent. So let's continue to pray for these goals that God would bless them. And please be faithful in your giving. So you can give at the back. We have an offering box. You can go online at ccbcmuriata.org slash giving or text the word give to 951-456-4542. And lastly, read your Bible in one year challenge. So uh, we've been uh, discussing about those ritual about skincare. I don't know if you've read that already. The uh, serious skin disease. I said, good thing Maxine wasn't alive during this time or else she will be unclean. 
<laughs> she will need also many uh, cleansing because there's specific description of how the skin would look like. So that part I found interesting. All right, so read your Bible in one year, and that's the last part of my announcement. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, uh, Brother David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good to be in the house of the Lord. We are so grateful. Thank you, Pastor Marlon, for uh, supplying the, the water. So uh, we are so blessed. First week of uh, February already. So we greeted Happy New Year now. Happy Valentine's. I know Easter is coming up next month. So, so I mean, we are all busy here. But, the, but then at the same time, you know, it is so, uh, 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 it's such a blessing to, to serve and, and honor the Lord in our, with our time with our talents and with our abilities. So, so praise the Lord for that. So this morning, we're going to continue our series, Redeeming the Time, and we are now in part five of seven. So, uh, so it's, uh, it's exciting to, to, to see that uh, you know, we are moving in, in this direction where God is actually reminding us that the, the life that we have, the time that we have in this world is short. So last week, I introduced the book of Haggai on how we will live our life for 2024 that God has given us. Let me give you again the context of the book. Uh, because of the disobedience of the southern kingdom of Judah, meaning that the, the United Kingdom of, of Israel, the nation of Israel was divided into two after Solomon passed away. So because of the disobedience of the southern kingdom of Judah was destroyed by the Babylonians and many were captured and brought to Babylon to live. So many of God's prophets during the time predicted that this captivity, the captivity of the southern kingdom, would not destroy the entire nation, but it would eventually end after 70 years later. God is going to allow them to get back home. So let me give you the full context of this summary from the Word of God in 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles, rather, chapter 36, verses 15 to 23. <clears throat> The Bible says the Lord, the God of their ancestors, repeatedly sent his prophet to warn them, for he had compassion on this people and, and his temple. But the people mocked these messengers of God and, this, and despised their words. They scoffed at the prophets until the Lord's anger could no longer be restrained and nothing could be done. So the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them. The Babylonians killed Judah's young men, even chasing after them into the temple. They had no pity on the people killing both young men and young women, and the old and the infirm. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. The king took home to Babylon all the articles, large and small, used in the temple of God, and the treasures from both the Lord's temple and from the palace of the king and his officials. Verse 19. Then his army burned the temple of God, torn down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all the palaces, and completely destroyed everything of value. The few, the few who survived were taken as exiles to Babylon, and they became servants to the king of his, and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came, came, came to power. So the message of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. The land finally enjoy its Sabbath rest, lying desolate until the 70 years were fulfilled just as the prophet had said. Now, before we continue, let me, let me add one thing, a side note on this, that uh, if, you're, if you're going to look at, verse 21 says, why, you know, explain why 70 years, you know, the, the exile lasted on 70 years. Well, to put an equation on it, it looked like this, 490 divided by 7 equals 70. Meaning that the span of 490 years, God's people had ignored God's law and they were to let, in a, to let the, the, the land rest every seventh year. Meaning that this is the mandate of God, that every seventh year, they need to have a Sabbath for the land. And so God collected all these unfulfilled Sabbath years at one time. And this is a good reminder that whatever God promised, He will fulfill and He will take rightfully, you know, what rightfully His. So meaning that the nation of Israel were not obeying the Lord's mandate and God, you know, fulfilled His mandate to, to have a Sabbath rest for 70 years. Verse 22. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy He had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put His proclamation in writing and to send it throughout His kingdom. 
This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go there for his task, and may the Lord your God be with you. So this is the Monday that God, that, that King Cyrus proclaimed. So with this decree by King Cyrus of Persia, 50,000 Jews returned to Judah to rebuild the altar and began offering sacrifices. Two years later, they finished the foundation of the temple, but then they stopped working and start focusing on their homes and their family in, in, in the next 16 years. So Haggai comes on the scene to tell them to put, to, to get back to work. This is what God is asking you to do, get back to work and, and, and encourage him to go back. And, and this is what it says in, verse, in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 5. This is what the Lord of heaven army says, look at what's happening to you. So here in verse 5, God refers to himself as the Lord of heaven's armies in order to get their perspective back that they are dealing with the powerful God of heaven. Meaning that God is actually declaring who, who he is. God is actually introducing himself, although God, you know, God knew that the people of the nation of Israel knew him, who he was. I mean, uh, but, but then uh, he needs to remind the people. So he said, this is what the Lord of heaven's, of, you know, of heaven's armies uh, says. Okay? And the reason for that was because they had lost their view of God. As a big and mighty, meaning that people during that time lost their, their, their concept about God. And the reason on this lesson is also to remind us that, that they, the people of Israel and us today, to recapture how mighty and majestic our God is. Meaning that we need to understand, we need to realize who is this God that we are serving. You know, meaning that, you know, we are challenging you that, uh, to serve and to honor and to worship God. But who is this God that we are serving today? The same God that the nation of Israel forget who he is or maybe lost their, their, their view of God who he is. Well, this is, this is the same God. And that is exactly what happened to these people. Instead of praising him, they were living for their own pleasure. That's what happened here. That's what's going on. In the last 16 years, they are actually living in the, in, on their pleasure. Then after God emphasizes who he is, that he is the Lord of heaven's armies. So, so the second half of the verse, as you can see, a, God says, look at what's happening to you. And this is where we get our, the title of our lesson today. Pause and, and you know, and, 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 and um, and, you know, look at what's happening inside of you. Look at what's happening to you. Because this is really the major message of Haggai. Because he repeated it five times in the two chapters. Five times that God, that, that, you know, God emphasis, okay? And re reminding the people, look at what's happening to you. Literally, it means think what, you know, about why things are not going well in your life. Meaning that look inside. What's going on on the inside? God wants us to engage our minds and do serious inventory in our own life. Because if we are not going to do that, then we're going to be living for ourselves instead for God. And that is the title of our, that is the reason why we, we title our series Redeeming the Time. Because we don't have much time left. And if we will live the way we are before, in previous year, 2023, or even previous year than that, then we will end up wasting again the remaining time that we have left here on this earth. Can you imagine? It's only, you know, one month is already gone for 2024. That is how time flies so fast, isn't it? The book of Lamentations, chapter 3 and verse 40, the Bible says, Let us examine our lifestyle, putting them to the test, and then turn back. To the Lord. That is the challenge here. You know, instead of looking around, look within ourselves. That is the challenge on this, on this verse. Okay? Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, the Bible says, Put yourself to the test and judge yourself to find out whether you are living in, in faith. Surely you know that Christ Jesus is in you unless you have completely failed. So, 
the prophet Haggai wanted the people to stop long enough in their busy schedules to evaluate their life in, in the light of God's word because sometimes that is what, what's happening to us. You know, life needs to move on. There's a lot of things going on. You know, we have only 24 hours, but there's a lot of a schedule that wanted five, 30 minutes over there, 15 minutes over there, you know, two hours over here. I mean, uh, there's a lot of things going on. In our 24 hours, is actually, we are actually dividing Biding it so that we can accommodate something. But the problem is that uh, sometimes there is no time left for God. You know, sometimes the God who are the givers of light, who are the giver of our time and strength and in whatever we have right now, left, you know, uh, nothing sometimes with, with, with the 24 hours that we have. So as a follower of the Lord, we need to evaluate how we spend our time, how we spend our money, and how we use our talents. We need to look at that because, because our failure to take the proper precaution today will result in severe consequences tomorrow. So this is the focus of our lesson. But before we continue, shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Father God in heaven, Lord, we are so blessed, O oh God, Lord, that uh, today is the first Sunday of February, O oh God, Lord. Thank you for what you have done in our life, O oh God, Lord, in the last month of January. We cannot take it back, O oh God, Lord, uh, whatever uh, we accomplish or not accomplish on that month, O oh God, Lord. What we can have is continue to pursue what, you know, the days that you, you, you keep giving on us, O oh God. Help us, O oh God, Lord, to become a good steward of what you've been given to us, O oh God, or whether time or talents or money or resources, O oh God. We're asking that may you bless each one of us. Help us, O oh God, Lord, to, push, to, to pause and think within ourselves, O oh God, uh, what, uh, what is our priorities. And may your Holy Spirit, O oh God, Lord, speak to each one of us directly. We commit all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to talk about pausing and looking at what's happening to us. So the focus on our lesson is not, it's not about other people. Okay? The focus of our lesson is about ourselves. We're going to use the life of, uh, of the people in uh, uh, you know, the nation of Israel uh, through the leadership of Haggai. So we're going to look at this story, but then... Uh, in, in return, in our application, what we are going to do is that we're going to take the, 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 the story and then we're going to apply in our life, looking at their story, what's going on in their life, and then to avoid the mistakes uh, in, and the consequences of not prioritizing the Lord, we're going to make action for ourselves. So it's between you and God today. So we just read in our text that the Babylonian had destroyed the city of Jerusalem. The Babylonian destroyed the city of Jerusalem. The, the Babylonian destroyed the Jewish temple and took all of the people of Israel into captive. Meaning that the remaining people who are alive, they take away and, and, and bring to, to Babylon. I shared it last week that when the children of Israel returned from 70 years of captivity, 50,000 of them, almost immediately they laid the foundation of the temple. Automatically, they, they work hard. However, after they laid the foundation, they misplaced their priority. After two years of working, you know, for, for God, they, they, you know, they got used to it. And after two years, they misplaced their priority. And for 16 years, only the foundation of the temple has been completed. Nothing has done. It's only the foundation. So the Lord was displeased with the action of these people. And so God sent two of his prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. God says, okay, go and, and, and remind my people of, of their assignment. So Haggai was commissioned by God to encourage the people to move on. That is the goal. Haggai show up and encourage the people to move on and to keep them focused and to help them set their priorities straight. Haggai wanted these people to take a long, hard look. I mean, meaning that Haggai is challenging them. Okay, don't look around, but look within you. Look, uh, you know, uh, you need to take a long, hard look and ask yourself, why is it that the work God gave you was uncompleted? 
Well, why after 16 years? You've been here for 18 years. 2 plus 16 is 18. So you've been here for 18 years. How come that the priority of God, God asked you to come here to build his temple? Why it's not yet done? So he wanted them to consider the Lord, to remember his promises and his purposes, and he wanted them to finish what they started 16 years ago. So in your outline, I have only three points in your outline. Number one is pause and look at your life priorities. Pause and look at your life priorities. So as I mentioned a while ago, it is between you and God. You need to look in your life. Okay, don't mind other people, look within you. You know, this is our self-evaluation. You know, as, as, as Brother Gary mentioned in our communion today, that, uh, you know, we need to have a self-evaluation. And this is the same thing. We're going to have a self-evaluation of our life to God. Now, let me remind you once again, before, uh, before we, we, we were heavy, uh, getting heavy on our, our description, what's going on in the life of this, of this uh, remnant returning, the 50,000 remnant returning from, uh, from Babylon. We need to understand that um, these people made a difficult commitment to leave their established way of life in Babylon. You know, when, when King Darius make a decree, these people... You know, it's already established in Babylon. They had homes and jobs in Babylon, and most of them had been born and raised there. So, yeah, they are Jewish people, but they were born and raised in Babylon. And, you know, it's like some of you are, are born and raised here, even though your mom and dad is Filipino, so, you, you, you know, but, but then uh, you're, you're born and raised here. You've never been to the Philippines yet, isn't it, some of you? So, so, so these people, they were born and raised in, in Babylon, but they knew that God's purpose for his people involved the, the promised land. You know, their parents were so diligent in telling them, you know what, uh, you know, this is what's going on, you know, back in Jerusalem. And they keep telling them the story behind why they are in, in, in Babylon right now. But this is not their homeland. Their homeland is in Jerusalem. And by faith, they had responded to the call to return by King Cyrus. They had committed themselves to the hardship of getting reestablished in the land that had been devastated by war. Remember, you know, uh, 70 years has been passed. So meaning that the land that they vacate, there are some people who are actually occupying the land. And, you know, they, 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 they can think, you know, generally thinking that, oh, you know, they are going to have a hard time reestablishing again. You know, they use their business here, you know, all of their trades. They have to resign from their job, you know, so, something like that. So probably most of them made this decision to return to Jerusalem because of their commitment to God. They were so committed to God, okay? But take a look in Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. This is what Haggai says. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time is not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord, uh, the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your final houses while this house remains a ruin? So shortly after returning uh, from their 70-year exile, in, as I mentioned a while ago, that they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. They rebuilt the, the foundation of the temple. Actually, the, you know, with the leadership of Nehemiah, Nehemiah led the group to, 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 to build the wall, the wall of Jerusalem. They also laid the foundation for the Jewish temple under the leadership of Ezra, the high priest. But that was 16 years ago. They started out strong, but something happened. They lost their focus. They kept saying, well, it's not yet time. It's not yet time. It's not yet time, okay? And they keep saying this, saying, well, I do it later. Maybe I'm probably I'm going to do it tomorrow. A year later, well, I, I, I know, I know, I know. I, I forget. I, I never even forget that. I will, I will do it tomorrow. I, will, I promise I'm going to do it tomorrow. Now, we know that those 16 years, we're filled with economic struggle and political instability. 
So the problem is not easy. You know, they have some enemies, they have some struggle, they have some, they have some conflicts that they, they need to resolve, to resolve. So to put the rebuilding of the temple probably made sense from a human perspective to delay a little bit because, you know, we are dealing with this. All of the issue we are dealing with, okay? Yet God knows that the real problem was not the economy, the real problem was not the weather, the real problem was the misplaced priorities among God's people. Their priority has shifted. Their focus has shifted. That's why God asked them, it is a time for you, as you can see here in verse 4, it is a time for you yourself to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin. So that's why, you know, this is the, 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 the question of the Lord. Now, it is time for us to have a, a, an application moment. So, so let us leave a this remnant a little while and then focus in ourselves. Let's move on for a life application on this point number one. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, there was a time in your Christian life there was a time when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There is a time in your Christian life that you made a personal commitment to Him. You are so committed to God to follow Him step by step. You decided to follow Jesus. At, the, uh, you know, at first, you were zealous, uh, very, very zealous in, uh, in, your spiritual, in all of the spiritual activities and events. You read your Bible every day. You got involved in, with God group Bible study. You got involved in serving in the church. I mean, uh, there's a lot of things going on. You know, you're so busy praying and serving and focusing your hearts and mind to honor God. But perhaps your efforts met with difficulties. Time comes in your life where you met some difficulties. Maybe you had a personality class with another Christian. There is some situation where you cannot even resolve or you encounter personal trials that God did not remove even after much of prayer. There are some trials and testing and you realize, well, I'm serving God and yet I have a trials and testing in my life. Why is this happening to me? Meanwhile, your life needs to, to move on. You have family to take care and you have bills to pay and other demands of your time. Remember, you have only 24 hours a day. And so the church and the Lord's work drifted on the background into your schedules. Yes, of course, you're still in church. From time to time, you, you know, if you have some time, you read your Bible, you have some devotion, but it has become a slice of your schedule and not the center, not like before. Before, it is always God. Then you realize, wow, yeah, I, I, I know, I know. I mean, uh, this is my life right now. But you tell yourself that you just don't have the time to serve today. You're so busy. Then when your conscience nags at you and you have a little pinch of the Holy Spirit, you have reason to explain why things are this way, like the reasoning of the Jews. If we will go back in verse 2 again, as you can see, uh, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come. The time is not yet. You know, it's not time. I'm not forgetting the Lord. I'm still on the Lord. You know, my heart is, belongs to the Lord. You know, God knows that, okay? And, and the problem is that we're all prone to make excuses for why we are not obedient to put God first with the time and money that he entrusted to each one of us. And let us remember, the time and the life that we have belongs to God. And God is the owner of the life and, and, uh, you know, that we have right now. And, you know, he can take it any time he wants. And he, did, he doesn't need our, our permission if he's going to take it. And sometimes, he, he, you know, for those of you who have deeper Bible knowledge, Sometimes you use the Bible to support your excuses sometimes. So that you counteract with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Well, this is what the Bible says. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. The Bible says every believer must take, must take care of his own family. Certainly, he must do that for the people who live with him in his home. If anyone does not do that, it shows that he has refused God's true message. That person is worse than someone who does not believe in Christ. 
So knowing this verse, knowing the Bible, you can easily say that I'm just trying to obey that verse by providing by, for my family. Well, my family is, pri is my priority. But someday, someday, pastor, I mean, someday, when all the kinds of things in my life go through, you know, when all, when all of the things that's going on in my life is, is, is cleared away. Or when all my kids go through college and my bills are paid and then we will give more time to the Lord. We will go back and serve again like I used to do. Maybe you're saying to yourself, well, this is a, you know, this, is, this schedule is a very hectic now. The kids are still young. Now that they were teenagers, well, I need to supervise them, you know. And there's a lot of things going on. I mean, uh, I mean, you, you you can you can tell and and you can you can do that. But 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 uh, but the, the the point is, whatever reason or excuses you will have in mind, or maybe you are making a dialogue and conversation with God, then tell tell God all of the things that you have in mind. But because one day we will see Him face to face, and we will give an account to Him. All the things that we do or did not do while we, are, we were living in this earth. It is your call. One day, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be, I, I'm going to give my account to God. It's only my life. And one day, you're going to give an account to God. It's only your life. And whatever reason we have, God knows. Remember, God, God is all-knowing God. So even though we convince ourselves that, oh, you know what, uh, you know, my, my God is my priority. God knows if, it, if, it, if, if, if God is your priority or not. Number two, we need to pause and look at the consequences of your misplaced priorities. So what happened? You know, God is our priority, but we have some misplaced priorities, so... What, what is the result on that? What is the consequences on that? Well, the Jews, and, the Jews and the nation of Israel had an excuse. They said, it is not time yet. We are not, we are not forgetting that Haggai. You know, prophet, I mean, we are not forgetting the temple. That's the reason we are here, isn't it? Yeah. So we, we, we never forget that. But if you're going to think about it, they had not done anything for 16 years straight. There's nothing done. There is still, and yet there still is uh, excuses is that it's not time yet. And the question is, when is the right time? When is the right time? When is the best season for you to prioritize the work of the Lord? I'm still in college. Okay. Now when you graduate, well, I have some student loan. I mean, you have to understand that. Now, now, okay, then you get married. Then you have children. Well, you have to understand. You know, I'm not forgetting the Lord. I am for the Lord. But then the point is this, okay? Look at this. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 4. But there are some things that you cannot be sure of. You must take a chance. If you wait for perfect weather, you will never plant your seeds. If you are afraid that every cloud will bring rain, you will never harvest your crops. Did you follow the what will be the weather today? Well, I, I, I received a, an update in my phone and it says, well, in about an hour, there's going to be a rain in Temecula and in, in Marietta. I said, oh, really? It's a Sunday tomorrow. I mean, <laughs> you know, anyway, wait, oh, oh, no, it's not even raining, you know. And, and, and this, is, this is the point that I, I would like to say. King Solomon says here, in order for us to live in this world, we need to take a risk. We need to take some risk. Because every time you go to work, either you drive or walk, or do some bike or e-bike, okay, there is always a risk that you will get in a, an accident. There is always a risk. But even there is a risk, and we know there is a risk, you go to work, you go to school, you go to the grocery store, isn't it? You go to the park. You go, to, you go and watch the movie. I mean, you go to L.A. and you go to San Diego. I mean, you, you go everywhere, isn't it? 
There is a risk of, of, of going out. But, but, but if, if the same thing, if we are going to apply the same thing in our service to God, that, that's, uh, you, know, it's, you know, there is a risk and you, we need to take a chance. Yeah, you are still in college, but serve God while you are still in college. You know, yeah, you're, you're newly wed. Well, serve God while, while the kids were young so that they will be able to see that you are serving God while they were young. So when they grow up and old, they will realize, you know what, my parents, Sunday is not, you know, Sunday is not a negotiable. We always go to church. We always worship. We always go to Sunday school. That is one thing that they remember. Because you are, you know, you are bringing them. Yeah, I know that after church, you have a lot of, a lot, a lot of things to do. You have your assignments, you have your, your deadlines, you have your, you have your laundry, you, you have to clean the house, you know, you have to clean the car. There's a lot of things going on, but those things will always there. And, you know, those things will, will, will ask your time. So you need to be intentionally split your time and serve God. You must take a chance. That is what King Solomon says here. Now here in chapter, in verses 5 to 11, Haggai share with us the consequences of their misplaced priorities. These people are not taking, you know, taking a chance. So he is trying to help, Haggai is trying to help these people to see the cost and effect between their misplaced priorities and the problems that they are having right now. So the first command God gives to people is that you spend time in self-reflection and evaluation. Let's go back to verse 5 in Haggai chapter 1. I, the Almighty Lord, tell you this. Think carefully about what is happening to you. Meaning that you need to have a self-evaluation of what's going on in your life right now. Because their priorities were wrong. They were struggling. The people, the nation of Israel, the, the remnant, the 50,000 people who returned to Jerusalem, they were struggling. You know, as a result, they had unmet expectations. Their life is empty and seemingly without meaning or purpose. Well, you know, constantly striving but never able to make ends meet. Have you ever tried that? That you are trying your best, but as if that is always short. You know, nothing is enough. You give your, your all of your effort, your all of your best, but it seems that always, you know, there, there is always lack. There is always lacking in the end. As I read the following verses. Put yourself in the picture, okay? Put yourself in the picture and imagine that Haggai is directly talking to you. He's speaking to you. So it, this is your self-evaluation. It's between you and God. Make an honest evaluation at your own life if the words of the prophet Haggai was actually happening to you right now. Look at this in verse 6. Haggai chapter 1 in verse 6. The Bible says, you have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. Have you ever experienced that? I, today is the 4th of February. I just... I just had my paycheck last week. Where is it? You know, as if that you, that, you know, some, you know there's a pickpocket on your, <laughs> you, you know, go, going home. You say, where, where is that money, you know? Where did I put it, okay? That is exactly what's, what Hage is telling here. What happened is that God hit their, agri their, their economy, their agri agriculture. You know, they had a lot of action, but they could not get satisfaction. Whatever they are doing as if, Something is missing, isn't it? Something is missing. God is specifically, specifically targeted here, as you can see in verse 6, three basic needs of life, food, water, and clothing. And what's happening to them was that God caused their affliction in order to get their attention. You know what, sometimes? God, you know, when, when, when something going on in your life and all of a sudden things happen, you need to stop and pause. Maybe God is getting my attention here. You need, you, you need to look at that. Because 
God allow these verses. You know, this, this verse 6 actually is, is a reminder for, for, for the nation of Israel. Haggai is actually reminding the remnant, the 50,000 people, okay? But this was allowed by God. These verses are actually allowed by God to be written. And we are able to read them in our present situation. It is because to serve as a warning. To, to warn us that we will never find satisfaction until our priorities are right and correct. And if this verse describes your life, then let the sense of dissatisfaction lead you to find satisfaction in God alone. Because before, if you're going to look back, try to recall your life. When you first got saved, when you accepted the Lord, when you make some commitment to God, everything is, you know, it's not perfect, but you are satisfied. You have a need, but you, have, but you are satisfied. Because during the time, God is the center of your life. Today, you need to realize that if God is not at the center of your life, even if you get what you think you need, it won't be enough. There is always lack in it. And you know what? You know, this is not only my opinion. I mean, actually, this, this, uh, what, what Hage is actually tell, t- telling them is actually being told, you know, told them a long time ago. Okay, look at this in Amos chapter 4 in verse 6. This is what the Lord says. You know, don't you, that I am the one who emptied your panties and cleaned out your cupboards, who left you hungry and standing in bread lines. But you never got hungry for me. That is the complaint of the Lord. You never got hungry for me. You continued to ignore me. Even what's going on in your life, you continue to, you know what? It is because of the weather. It's a bad luck, you know. Oh, that's not a good season. Oh, it's El Nino. Okay. That's why, you know, we have this drought or La Nina. Okay. I don't know. What is that? I mean, I don't know. You know, there's a lot of water, something like that. I mean, uh, now, The truth that we need to understand is that God is asking us, take a look. Seriously, take a look at the mess in your life and what's been happening when you put yourself first instead of me. How's that working out for you? Yeah, you you have have work, you, you know, you have resources, not like before. But if you're going to compare your life, before and, and then today, it seems more enjoyable during the time when, you, when God is at the, at the center of our life, isn't it? Let us remember that God is all-knowing and he, he not only under, understood there's, you know, our circumstances, instead, he was the one who caused them. That is the reason why that's what's happening to the, to, the, to, to the life of these people, in, um, uh, the remnant in, um, uh, in, in the time of Haggai. Sometimes God give us what we want so, so that we will experience some consequences with the ultimate goal that we will turn back to Him. That is the goal. So that we will be able to turn back to God. Because only God can satisfy our souls. Only God can satisfy your souls. The more we ignore Him, the worse thing will get into our life. Stop ignoring God. Verse 7, let's go back, let's go to verse 7. Haggai continued. He said, thus says the Lord of hosts. Okay, this is another, you know, Haggai, as I mentioned, Haggai repeated these words more, probably five times. Thus said the Lord of hosts, consider your ways and thoroughly reflect on your conduct. Here in verse 7, Haggai repeated what he said in verse 5. Pause and look at what's happening to you. They expect a lot each time they planted their seeds. Yet, when harvest time, they were continually disappointed with a small crop. Oh, it's small again. Oh, what's going on? How come it's so small again? They were unsatisfied in their personal lives. They eat, but they were not, never really full. They drink, but it was never enough, and they were broke. They make money, and as soon as they cast their check, it seems to be gone. It seems to be gone, you know? There's nothing add up. How come? 
Then you blame the economy. Oh, because of the economy, you know, prices go up. I mean, blah blah blah. I mean, uh, well, we we may think that they that 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 you know that is the problem, but but this is the the, the situation. Instead of looking back. Looking back, you know, the people in Haggai, instead of looking back and learning from the lessons that God is bringing to them, they will turn, you know, and, and turn to God after this, this, this event. It is not happening. They are not happening because they keep saying, well, it is not time yet for us to rebuild the temple because how can we rebuild the temple when our harvest is so little? How can we rebuild the temple when we are unsatisfied and broke? How can we go, how can we prioritize God, you know? You know, the, the income that I have is not even enough. But one day, one day, time will come. We know that one day, for sure, we will rebuild the temple when our needs are met. Let's look in verse 9. You hope for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruin, says the Lord of heaven's armies. This is what happened. The things that, you know, they are hoping for the things that they are bringing home. Oh, this will bring satisfaction in my life. This is this and that. I mean, uh, this is the, the source of our happiness. This is the solution of our problem. And you know what, what God says? When you brought your harvest, when you brought your income, when you brought your, the things that you are hoping for, what God did? I blew it away. Now, all of a sudden, you have some situation, you know, unexpected um, uh, expenses here and there, you know. You need to change the tires. You need to. There's a lot. Really? I mean, that's your 700? Oh, that's an extra expense. You know, you know, as David says that, uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, as a church, we, we have some, you know, we have a budget and sometimes the budget is, you know, we need to live within the budget, but sometimes there's an extra expense that you never even foresee. The same thing in our life. You know, this, this is the amount that you are, that, that you are going to, to, to receive for, for the end of the month. And you are actually say, uh, thinking, well, I'm going to use half of it. Or maybe three ports of it so that I have one port. But you know what? No, it not happened. You have 100% plus 15% of what you have last month. You are short 15% probably. Why? I blew it away, God says. Because my house lies in ruin, says the Lord. This is exactly what Haggai says. You've got it all wrong. The ultimate cause of your trouble is not just a bad economy or bad luck or bad weather. The real cause of your problem is actually the consequences of your misplaced priority. You are not prioritizing, prioritizing God. God says in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What is the all these things? Well, if you go back to verse chapter, verse 31 and 30, or 32, 31 and 30, you're going to find out that, that, that you know, that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Gentiles are thinking about, uh, you know, what they can eat, what they can, uh, you know, drink, you know, the clothing and everything. All of the need for, for, for our daily needs. And God says, I will provide all of those. But seek ye first. Seek me first. And all these things that they are thinking about, I will just add that to you. That is the real cause. God has caused their economy to struggle. And until they get their priorities straight, life will continue not working for them. As if they always make a wrong turn and wrong plan. No, why? Because God says, I blew it away. Now, once again, let's leave the nation of Israel here and focus in ourselves. Okay? Let's take a life application here. Because sometimes, you know, Looking at the nation of Israel, it's easy for us to see their sins and mistakes. Oh, look at those people. While we are actually ignoring our own walk with God. What about us? 
And so let's get personal for a moment here. Like the Jewish people who have a lot of excuses in their misplaced priority, it is also the same practice and excuses for us today. And sometimes your excuses is valid as, as their excuses. You know, you have your priorities, you have your life, you have, you have some issues that you, you need to resolve. It seems that everything is valid and we are not discounting those. But the reason why life is not working for you because there is one thing that you did not include or probably remove or probably did not prioritize in your schedule and that is God. God says, seek me. Because like these people, how can we give? Sometimes, you know, how can, Pastor Romy, how can, how can I serve? I don't have time. You know, how can I do this? Pastor Romy, I mean, I don't have enough resources. Well, the reason why it's happening is because you did not put God in that particular situation. God says, seek me first. I will take care of it. You know, remember the feeding of the 5,000? You know, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus Christ says, you know, to the disciple, okay, there is a 5,000 5, men here plus, plus children plus women, okay? You need to feed them. And, and the disciple approached uh, Jesus Christ and said, with what? I mean, uh, with what can, you know, there's a lot of people here. And even a year wages, one year wages, my one year wages will not even enough. If, I'm, if you're going to buy, uh, you know, the, the food, it's not even enough. Well, as, as uh, th there is a boy. They have five loaves and two fishes, isn't it? It's not enough. You know, that is, that is his lunch. It's not enough. But he gave it to Jesus. And Jesus Christ says, well, I'm going to, I, 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 will, go, I, I, will, I will do something for this. And he created a miracle that the four gospel was recorded, the feeding of the 5,000. And guess what? You know, at the end of the, of the feeding, I mean, uh, you know, it's like a buffet. You know, uh, the, the Bible says that, you know, the, the, the disciples keep giving them, food, uh, you know, fish and, and, and bread, uh, you know, uh, up to the point that, oh, it's, it's okay, we're, we're done. I mean, uh, have you ever been uh, on that restaurant? I mean, I forgot the, the Brazilian restaurant where you're uh, uh, for the steak. You know, you have, what is that? What's the name? Okay, okay, so... So anyway, so, so I, I remember Honey brought us there. So, so oh, Dad, you know, you can eat. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, uh, my eye is so big, you know. And I always, I always uh, uh, you know, put up this, uh, you know, you, they have a timer where if it is uh, red, you know, stop. If it's green, they keep coming to you. You know, if it is uh, laying on the table, you know, they will stop coming to you. And then because you're resting, you, you know, and then uh, they will come back. You know, that, that, that is the situation. And, and, uh, and this is exactly what's going on in the, in, 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 uh, in the feeding of the 5,000. The, the disciples, you know, the 12 disciples are actually giving, okay, more bread. Okay, what about on this area? Okay, more bread and, uh, or more fish. I mean, uh, and they keep bringing and bringing and bringing all of the fish. Remember, how many fish is that? Two. How many bread? Five. But God may, you know, feed 5,000 men plus women, plus children. According to some Bible scholar, uh, and, uh, you know, they said that probably 10,000 to 15,000 people. A lot of people were being fed by five uh, loaves and two, and two fish. Same thing with you. You have only 24 hours. God says, give it to me. I will multiply it. You know, sometimes you don't know what to do with your time. Give it to God. Let God handle it. Look at this. Uh, the, the Bible says in Luke chapter 16, verses 10 to 12, God says, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are not dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things on your own? This is the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said that our obedience is not dependent on how much we have. God is not actually requiring you that you need to have more enough time or extra time so that he can serve him. No, God says he is not requiring us of what we have. Our obedience is not dependent on that. 
If you practice to be faithful in little things, in little amount, in little talent, in little time that you have, God will grant us more time, more talent, and more money to honor and give it to God. But the problem is that we keep on looking on that day. One day, pastor, one day. One day when God give me the bigger and everything that I'm thinking about, then I can honor God. Then I can serve God. Then I can give and, uh, you know, my, my, my offering to God. But the question is, how much is plenty and, and, and much? You know, how much is plenty and much that you are waiting for God so you can honor Him? God gave you little and God says, well, honor me with that, with that little one and I'll make it grow. That is what God is, uh, is telling us, you know. Whatever amount of money you have, honor God with that. He, you know, if you have $10, honor God with $1. Who knows? Maybe God is going to uh, add that with another zero and another zero and another zero. And now you are honoring God that you cannot even imagine. Wow. Why? Because God entrusted you with little and you are so faithful in little. And now God, can, again, God knows, I, I can trust you with much. I can trust you with much. Jesus clearly says that those times will not happen. If you are waiting for God to give you big so that, he can, that, so that you can honor him, it will never happen. Because Jesus clearly says, he can clearly see that we are not trustworthy in small things. How can we be trusted in the bigger things. Let's go back to verse 8. Haggai chapter 1 and verse 8. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house. So that I may take pleasure in it and, and, he, uh, and, and, and be honored, says the Lord. Here in verse 8, the Lord clearly gave them this instruction. Go up to the mountain. Bring some timber and build my house. But for your information... They have already the timber 16 years ago. They have the timber. They have the material 16 years ago. When they, you know, when they, when, when, when they decided to, to go back, you know, to, to, to Jerusalem, King Cyrus provided that. Let's go back to Ezra chapter 3 and verse 7. The Bible says, Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and, and, and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by, by Cyrus, king of Persia. The question is, where's the logs? They already have the materials. Where is the materials intended use for the temple? Well, the simple answer that, as I mentioned it last week, it could probably use to build their own houses instead of the Lord. Let's go back to verse 3 to, to, to remind our, you know, our, uh, you know uh, our, to review our lesson last week. Verse 3 says, It is time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin. And maybe that is our reason, you know, you know, because sometimes they have the materials, but probably, according to Haggai, you use it to panel your house. You use it for your own selves in the last 16 years. And maybe that is our reason why we cannot honor God with whatever He has given us, whether it is time, whether it is talent or money, that instead of giving it to God, we use it first for ourselves. Oh, God may understand. Even we know that those times and talents and money is designated and belongs to God in the first place. And, and, and my point is this. You can have millions of excuses and reasons why God is your less priorities in life, but in the end, you will pay a high price and consequences of our misplaced priority. Because you know what? You are, you, you are doing a disservice to yourselves. You are actually robbing yourselves of the life that God wanted for you to live. You are actually, you know, you are actually uh, uh, taking advantage of yourself. 
Instead of having enough resources to meet your needs, you find that there is never enough. Why? I'm, I'm, you know, you're working 24 hours if you can, but it's never been enough. Instead of God taking pleasure in the church, we find God's heart grieved. Instead of the church revealing God's glory to a lost world, God's glory is covered by misplaced priorities of everyday Christians. Let's take a look in verses 10 and 11. Therefore, this is what Haggai said, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the field and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock and all the labor of your hands. And as we can see here, the Jews may have an interest in seeing the temple rebuilt, but there was no commitment. And for your information, commitment and interest are two different things. Maybe the reason why they, they, they went back to, to Jerusalem because they were committed to God, but now that they are living in Jerusalem, they become interested in building the temple. And interest and commitment are two different things. And one of the things that I noticed today, in the life of the Christian now, today, Christian seems to be less focused on commitment, but more focused on convenience. They were so focused on convenience. Oh, it's raining today. Let's, do, let's go next week. <laughs> I have a new shoes, and uh, it's going to be ruined, you know. <laughs> you, you know? It's too hot. And, you know, my skin is going to. <laughs> so, let's go. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things. I mean, uh, that, that, and you know what? I mean, um, sad to say, this is, this is the life, this is the world that we live in. And unless you counteract on this, you're going to be persuaded with other people. Sometimes Christian itself. You know? But let us remember that you are not going to be accountable to another Christian or encourage you. Don't serve. Look at me. I'm not serving. You know? And I'm okay. <laughs> One day, he's going to face God. And he's going to answer God himself. You are not going to say, well, God, you know what? I'm not to serve you. But, you know, he, he, you know he, he persuaded me. And God says, well, I give you free will, isn't it? It is up to you. And to be honest with you, it is so easy to become a Christian today. Because when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, you are saved and you are already a Christian. But being a practicing Christian is a different story. Because it is so hard to follow God and trust Him everything that we have, isn't it? I mean, yeah, God promised that we will go to heaven one day, but the problem is that He did not bring us to heaven right away. We're still here. We're stuck here, isn't it? Until the Lord's come, until the death comes into our lives. So I, I'm giving this message to show to each one of us, that the ultimate cause of our trouble is not just bad economy or bad luck or bad weather, but the cause of our problem sometimes is maybe because of our misplaced priorities. We need to look at it. We need to evaluate. It is between you and God. Because just like the people of the Haggai generation, when you put God last in our priorities, when you put God last in your priorities, then life stops working for you. Everything seems wrong. What's going on? Because God itself says, I blew it away, God says. Your plan, I blew it away. Your business, I blew it away. Number three, and this is the last point in your outline. Haggai did not just bust the Jews in, <laughs> with, with misplaced priorities, but pointing what they are doing. I mean, just to challenge them to evaluate. Then, in point number three, God gave them the solution. Pause and look at the solution. What is the solution? What can you do? I mean, uh, yeah, this is what's going on in your life. What can you do? He, you know, Haggai gave the plan on how they will correct what's wrong and what they neglect 
to do in the last 16 years. And the same advice can also work for us, for you. If you have misplaced priorities, if we will follow and apply this plan, because verses 12 to 15, we will learn when we realign our priorities again to God's priorities, like when you were newly born again Christian, then his blessing will follow and flow it again in your life. Verses 12 to 15. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai. Because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messengers, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. Verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. As you can see here, when they realize, when they have some evaluation and they see the solution, they were inspired. They do something about it. If you're going to notice the realignment of God's priority, it begins with leadership. Zerubbabel was the governor of Israel during the time. Joshua was the high priest. And only after the leaders got their priorities straight, because the problem here is that Zerubbabel and Joshua, you know, the governor and the high priest, their, their priority is, is also not straight. So that's why the people are actually, well, if our leader is not doing what they, what they are supposed to be doing, then let's, let's not do what we're supposed to be doing. So only after the leaders got their priorities straight, then the rest of the people follow their lead. Now the people start following. And we see this principle again and again in the Bible. And this is why we believe in our church here. You know, that the pastors and leaders need to set the example for the rest of the congregation in this area of priorities. Meaning that if I, as a pastor, or any of the board of deacons or directors here in our church are not willing to give their time, their talents, and money for the work of the ministry, then I can hardly expect that anyone else in the church will give willingly their time and talents and money in the work of the ministry. Because if the pastor are not doing it, well, why am I not going to do it, you know? Can you imagine that I'm challenging you to read your Bible and I'm not reading my, <laughs> my Bible? You know, you know, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging the congregation, oh, read your Bible in one year challenge. And then if you're going to ask me, okay, did you read your Bible, pastor? No. Oh. But you're supposed to be reading. Okay? No. I, I, you know, I need to be diligent on this one. It is because, uh, you know, if you're going to ask me, okay, so I'm challenging you to give your tithe and offering. Then you come back to me and say, did you give your tithe and offering? If I say no, but for the, for the record, I'm giving, okay? <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, Anna and I were so faithful in this one, you know? Before we even get married, that is uh, the principles that we, are that we are living from the, you know, living in the Philippines, pastoring in the Philippines, and even here. You can check our record, and we are giving more than, you know, the, the, you know God asked us to do and, and, and give. Why? So that we can be a good example to you. And, and, and the, the point is, is this, you know. If any of the leadership is not doing what we are asking you to do, then you cannot, you know, you can come back to us and say, yeah, well, you are asking us to, to volunteer and you are not even volunteering your time. You ask us to lead, to attend Bible study, you are not even attending Bible study. That, that, that is the point that I would like you, you, you to see here, okay? Uh, and, and so I'm challenging you. I'm challenging all of us, including myself, again. Let us realign our priorities. If, you're, uh, if your priorities is aligned, then, then look again. If there is some misalignment, you know, in the year of 2024, realign again. Realign again. The, you know, because time is running out. And that is the reason why we're studying this series about redeeming the time. Because don't spend the, the remaining time that you have for something that will not matter into eternity. You are busy doing something, but at the end of the day, in eternity, it doesn't even matter. 
So align your priority for the Lord's agenda that could only be met with your intentional obedience. This is the challenge. I challenge you this year to intentionally commit yourself to fellowship, to prayer, to worship, and personal discipleship. You know, let, you know uh, commit yourself. Th that Sunday is not, it's not an optional for you. If you cannot be here in the church because you're out of town or out of the country, then someday you are going to find something that you can worship and honor God because it is between you and God. It's not, it's not because of me. It is between you and God. This is for you, for your benefit. Another thing is that intentionally commit to get involved in the ministries. We are actually challenging you, involved in the ministry. I like what, what, what David uh, mentioned about, uh, about uh, introducing a special person in your life. You know, um, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you never even mentioned Jesus Christ in your co-workers or, co or, or, or classmates, uh, maybe because you don't know how. As a church, we are committed to help you to introduce Jesus to them. Introduce Jesus to them. Include in the conversation. Intentionally commit to get involved in the ministry of our church. Use your spiritual gifts. Spend more time in serving, not just coming on Sunday. I'm so blessed that you are here every Sunday. But please, I mean, uh, you, you know, not, not only to come on Sunday, but, you, you know, do something. With your time, with your, with your ability. That's why as a church, we are actually, even, even out of the church activities, we are actually challenging you to commit and, and be involved in the uh, you know, Special Olympics. Why? Not for the church benefit, but for your benefit. So that you will be able to see yourself that you are actually serving God in this area. Intentionally commit to get involved in our outreach ministry. We have a lot of outreach ministry, you know, in the coming in the coming weeks and months, and and uh, and, and and personal evangelism. You are going to be challenged on this one. And this is the promise from God: when we align our priorities with His priorities, then His blessing will follow. His blessing will follow. So in closing, our lesson of the day is forcing us to pause to look inside of what's happening to us, what's happening in your life, and what's happening in your walk with God. Now, I would like to repeat that life is short in this world. Life is so short in this earth, and, and, and one day we are going to see God face to face. One day, we will be able to see God face to face. And whatever is our reason why we are not doing what He is asking us to do, we will explain it to Him on that day. We are going to give an account on that day to God. And it's hard to imagine. Now, now I know that uh, you, we really don't know, can predict what's going on, what will happen in the 2024. It is hard to predict. It's hard to see and look forward. But the way to have a free view is by asking yourself, how is my life last year? That is the only way you can review your life. Because if you're going to look back last year, and your answer is, my life is okay, but not that great. And if you are thinking that the reason why is because of the economy, or you know all of the bad stuff that's happening in your life, well... That is not the case. Think again. Because maybe you have a misplaced priority like the people of Israel. As the prophet of Haggai pointed out that they have planted much, but they but, but harvest little, they eat, but do not become full. And, and probably maybe that is what's going on in your life. And if this is what you're experiencing right now, then it is time to change. It is time to change. This is this is the the, the, the first week of February. Uh, first week of February, meaning that we have 11 months to go for 2024, and we use up already the month of January. So it's okay. So, but you have still 11 months, and I challenge you, please don't let what happened in 2023 become the repeat performance of your life in 2024. If if if, if good things happen in 2023, then then do more. Okay. Do, don't be satisfied on, on, on what you accomplished last year. Do more. Today is your chance to change the course of your life. Today is your opportunity because God is inviting you and me to prioritize him so he can bless your life again. Look at this, Haggai chapter 2 and verse 19. 
But after today, I will bless you. That is what God says. After today, after you put your, 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 your priorities straight, God says, uh, but after today, I will bless you. You will have many good things. So spend time today in your prayer time by yourself, your devotional time. You need to ask this question, asking a reflective question while you are driving probably by, your, you, know, you know, going to work or uh, by yourself. You need to ask God, communicate with God. God, show me where I'm not pleasing you. God, I don't want to repeat that last year. Show me where I'm not pleasing you. Show me where my priorities are wrong. And help me to straight it up so that I can honor you. Let's follow this advice. And, and when, when God show it to you, this is what you need to do. Psalms 119 verses 59 to 60. And this is our last verse this morning. I thought very carefully about my life. And I decided to follow your rules. When God show you everything that you need to change, follow this. Verse 60. Without wasting any time, I hurried back to obey your commands. So this is your life as you evaluate. Let us follow these action steps from the Lord. Would you please bow your head and close your eyes and we will go to the Lord in prayer. While every head bounce and I close, I know that uh, sometimes it's so hard to face ourselves because it is painful sometimes that they have a lot of things that we know that is not pleasing. We are doing some things that we know that sometimes it hurts God. And, and sometimes we don't want to face it. This is for our own good. The reason why sometimes we, we go to the doctor, it is because the doctor is going to tell us straight, if we have something wrong in our life, he's not going to they are not going to sugarcoat on it. They're going to tell you right away. But we are grateful that the doctor is actually giving us those direct words. And what we heard today is the word of the Lord speaking to us directly. That sometimes we need to confront ourselves. We need to look deep down in our hearts. And we need to ask this question, Lord, show me where, am I, where I am not pleasing you in my life. Show it to me. May the Lord lead you May the Lord guide you. Let me pray for you today. Father God in heaven, Lord, we are grateful, O oh God, for your word, O oh God. Thank you, God, for reminding us what happened to the book of, uh, to the life of the, uh, the, the remnants in, uh, in the book of Haggai, O oh God, Lord, is, is an example that we can, that we can learn from their stories, oh God. We don't need to repeat or we, we don't need to reap the consequences of their misplaced priority. We can, we can correct it right now, oh God. Before it happened that all of our effort and the things that we're doing is not even productive, may you help us, oh God, that we will be able to connect and ask you the direct question, Show us, oh God. So today we are giving ourselves to you. May you speak to our hearts, oh God. May your Holy Spirit, Lord, con continually convict us in the next, in the coming days before Sunday, oh God, Lord, that we will be able to have a soul search, oh God. Have a evaluation. How are we doing? With our life, with our resources, with our time, with our money, with our talents, O oh God. We're asking you, God, that may you help us, O oh God, to realign our misplaced priority. And may our priorities always be you before anything else. 
May you help your children, O oh God. Help them, God, not to suffer the consequences of their misplaced priority. But today, give them the chance to correct right away. Go directly to the conclusion, O oh God, Lord, where what is the solution, O oh God? And I know that you're going to lead us, O oh God. We're grateful for your love for us, for your continuous guidance, O oh God, for, for continually giving us the chance to go back to you. Because you want to bless us, oh God. You want to make the blessings flow again into our life. May you bless your children, oh God, Lord, today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we all stand, please? And uh, uh, our uh, praise team is going to lead you in a war, in a uh, song and a prayer.
for this day, Lord, for gathering us together to be able to worship you, Lord, in song. And we thank you for that message, Lord. And pray that you help us, Lord, with our priorities, Lord. Help us to prioritize you first in our life, Lord. And thank you for all the blessings you've given to us, Lord. And I pray now for the protection for all of us as we go home today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming. Have a blessed Sunday.